Top Bed Talk. So now we're going to have a double act. Uh, it was going to be Professor Mike Grocott up next. He's been slightly delayed. He will be with us. But we're going to hear the results of EPOC, E-P-O-C-H, which will be explained in a second. And Professor Rupert Pierce has been joined by a, a guest who happened to be in town, Carol Peden, who now lives and works on the west coast of America, who's part of the EPOC team, and they're going to tell you about the results. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Monty. Um, so I thought about thanking everyone at the end, but then I was worried I might forget, so I'm going to thank everyone now. I hope that's OK. EPOC was an enormous national project in the NHS. We had 93 hospitals participate in the trial, and there are far, far too many people to mention, both in the central teams and in individual hospitals. But there are three people that I would particularly like to mention. First is Carol Peden, who, as many of you will know, is an extremely knowledgeable and experienced quality improvement expert. And without Carol's input, EPOC would never have happened. Tim Stevens, who worked with Carol on the quality improvement project and did a lot of the groundwork in making sure that 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 approach worked. And then finally, and perhaps most important to me personally, Anne Thompson, who was the uh, EPOC trial manager, who at one particular point was the only thing that stood between me and the site liaison unit uh, (laughs) in my trust as we struggled with the enormous problems of information governance uh, in completing and publishing the EPOC findings. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Carol and let her talk a little bit about the background to the trial and the intervention that we designed. Thank you, Rupert. And morning, everybody. It's great to be in London. So this was EPOC, Enhanced Perioperative Care for High-Risk Patients. But as you all know, I think this was really about emergency laparotomy. Those really, really high-risk patients, particularly because they're emergencies and they're often elderly. The background to this paper was informed by a paper that Rupert published in uh, 2006, which said that 80% of surgical deaths occurred in 12% of the surgical population. And that if we could focus on those really high-risk patients, we could reduce surgical mortality and improve outcomes for very many patients. As I say, emergency laparotomy is a classic high-risk surgical patient. We know that patient care is highly variable, and when you have highly variable care, unsurprisingly, you have highly variable outcomes and survival. So the background of this study was could a quality improvement to deliver evidence-based care reliably improve outcome for these very high-risk patients? So the background, there was a number of studies at the time, and we conceived EPOC at the end, really, of 2012, but a number of studies around that time that informed our thinking. This was a big database study um, from Simons and colleagues which looked at the variation in outcome of high-risk emergency surgical admissions, both patients who underwent surgery and those who did not. And an interesting thing about this uh, paper was that they correlated the outcomes with resources. If you went to a hospital that had a low number of ICU beds and poor imaging facilities, particularly CT scans, your outcome was likely to be poorer. And so, again, that was informing this theory that variation of care is very, very important in whether you have a good or a poor outcome. And if you look at this slide, the variation up there in whether you're a high or a low performance hospital is very significant. Again, around the time that we were thinking about this study, two very significant papers, and many of you in the room were part of the Emergency Laparotomy Network, the paper we published in the BJA in 2012, which looked at 1,800 patients in 35 hospitals. And we showed a mortality of the average patient 15% at 30 days, but 24% if you were over 80. Again, in the same year, data from the very big database held by the American College of Surgeons, the NSKIP database, they reported on 37,000 patients Pretty much the same mortality as we saw in the UK, 14% at 30 days, but they were showing a 50% mortality for patients over 70 years of age. So I think you will agree we had our burning platform for a study to start to think about how we could tackle this problem. So around the time of those studies, there was another, in, in the UK, if you were here, there was a great deal of information reports coming out. Those included knowing the risk from an NCPOD, the 
a report on elderly patients undergoing surgery and very many others that stated care was falling below the standards that could be expected and there was a lot of things that we could do better. A particularly important report was the high-risk uh, surgical patient document from the Royal College of Surgeons and Department of Health. And all those reports informed our thinking that for this project, we could develop a care pathway. The components of this pathway were developed through a Delphi process, and we came up with this rather complicating looking pathway of 37 components that were the basis of the EPOC study. Now, Tim Stevens and I thought to make this, we, Tim, Tim spent a lot of time making this look nice to try to make it more accessible to teams. And what we did was break it down into pre op, intra op, and post operative. And we also highlighted some points, you may not be able to see it, but you can look at it in, on the website, which we thought were key nodes, really important points in this 37-component pathway. The, the pathway was the hard core of the EPOC study, what we were actually going to do. But the soft periphery was the quality improvement process, how we were going to try and help teams uh, to give them the tools to make that happen. And those tools consisted, or we had six strategies to think about our improvement. Number one was to engage our stakeholders, and that was, we did that in several ways. One was to encourage teams very early in the process to get everybody in the room, and that included people from ED, radiology, the OR nurses, um, everybody that might touch the patient, and talk about the pathways and talk about where care was falling down and where it could be made better in their own specific context of their hospital. We also deliberately did things like have pens, mugs, lanyards to create that discussion around what's this EPOC study and what are we doing about it. We also asked teams to review five sets of cases to see how against those 37 components they performed. Because Often people think they're performing better than they are when they actually go and look at the data. We asked teams to build a QI team which should consist of a surgeon, an anesthesiologist, an intensivist, and ideally nurses as well. We wanted people to analyze their emergency laparotomy audit data. And remember, Neela, the first patient data entry, only started four months before the first EPOC hospital, so that was very new. We wanted teams to use run charts to see their live, pretty much live information and then feedback and act on it and use quality improvement methodology, short cycles of change and testing things. And then to break down the pathway, that huge 37 pathway was challenging, break it into chunks where you could influence change and work on areas where you would have most impact. So the objectives of EPOC were to test whether a quality improvement project to implement a care pathway could improve 90-day survival after emergency laparotomy. We had an integrated ethnographic evaluation to see, to understand what was actually happening with teams at the front line. We evaluated all the different processes in the care pathway, and we had a cost-effectiveness analysis. So I'll hand over to Rupert for the rest of it. Thank you. Carol, thank you very much. So the trial design we use is something that you may be seeing more and more of in perioperative trials and critical care trials as well. It's called a step wedge cluster randomised trial. You are not under any circumstances to call it a randomised cluster trial or the statisticians will get very upset with you. You'll have to get them to explain why that's so important. And I'll talk a little bit about what that design allowed us to do in a second. We randomised hospitals into geographical clusters of between five and seven hospitals. And the logic of doing that was partly so that we could avoid the problems of contamination that may happen with staff, nurses and doctors moving between hospitals and probably perhaps contaminating hospitals that hadn't launched in the quality improvement at that stage. And also it meant that geographically teams within their own regions were more likely to know their colleagues locally and work with them together. The integrated ethnographic and economic analyses and the process evaluation are, are extremely important. A lot of us get really, really frustrated when these sophisticated trials are drilled down to a p-value. 
Um, and that can be really, really unhelpful. There's an incredible amount of nuanced learning from EPOC, and we'll have at least five papers, if not more, uh, trying to explain the full breadth of what we learned from the trial. So I'd encourage all of you to, as those papers come out, to understand the full breadth of the understanding of, of what we discovered as we did the EPOC trial. And of course, very importantly, we couldn't have done the trial at all if it wasn't for the uh, National Emergency Laparotomy Audit. And actually, we set the two projects up in tandem and we're bidding for funding for the two projects in tandem. So the, the entirety of the data for EPOC were entered through the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit and that was an important partnership. So the step wedge, as you can see, uh, allowed us to structure a series of before and after studies geographically across the country. We started at time zero, we waited for five weeks, and then we opened the first cluster and launched our quality improvement intervention in the hospitals in that first cluster. And then five weeks later, we launched the second cluster and so on throughout the trial. So you can see that if you're the first cluster to be opened, you would have been exposed to the quality improvement intervention for well over a year, around 80 weeks, whereas the final cluster in the trial would only have been exposed to the intervention for about five weeks before the trial closed. And that is important to understand that you need this kind of trial design to have a really robust and objective evaluation of this kind of organisational level exposure, but that does actually impose some constraints on the way that the quality improvement approach is taken. NIDA obviously collects data on a, on, a, on a very wide number of patients, but we restricted the trial to patients aged over 80 who are undergoing non-elective open abdominal surgery in acute NHS hospitals. We excluded gynecological laparotomies, trauma laparotomies, repeat laparotomies from a previous surgical procedure and simple appendicectomies. Really, we were after that classic emergency laparotomy patient that we think of, an elderly patient who's maybe had an acute perforation or, or has acute bowel obstruction. Our outcome measures were 90-day mortality. We deliberately didn't choose 30-day mortality, partly because we now know that most sick surgical patients will be kept alive in intensive care for a lot longer than 30 days, and partly because 30 days isn't a great success outcome for surgery. It's a good measure of harm, but not a great measure of success. In terms of secondary outcomes, we kept it quite simple. We looked at hospital stay, hospital readmission within 180 days, and 180-day mortality. We developed our sample size calculation using hospital episode statistics data. But it's important to understand that hospital episode statistics don't actually have a code for emergency laparotomy that you can study. So we had to look at a different series of diagnostic codes within those data. And that suggested that over 85 weeks, we might recruit around 27,000 patients and that we could expect them to have a mortality of around 25% at 90 days. So... Given the uncertainty of the HES data, we uh, elected to choose a very conservative uh, mortality reduction target of just 3% from 25% to 22% at 90 days. But the important thing about the trial design is it has the potential to recruit every single eligible patient and therefore is truly generalisable in terms of the learning. And recruiting 93 hospitals, of course, is a very real learning of relevance to the NHS. So the results... You're the first to hear these, so you're very important, you're very special. This is the first public presentation of these findings. This is the trial flow chart. It's incredibly complicated when you try and map a consort diagram to both the hospitals that you recruited according to inclusion exclusion criteria and the patients you recruited according to inclusion exclusion criteria. I just emphasise one thing in the flow diagram and that is the very difficult to explain observation that we had more patients in the usual care arm than we did in the quality improvement arm. So the usual care arm preceded the quality improvement in every single cluster in every single hospital. And it would be logical, you could understand how engagement with NILA might increase as a result of the quality improvement project. And therefore, there may be more patients returned via NILA once they launched with quality improvement. What we're not quite sure about is why there were more patients before that happened. But that's an interesting observation and something we've not been able... We've got lots of theories, but no single explanation for that is. So I, I highlight that one observation. Apart from that, we had very good data completeness, we had very good outcomes, some complexity with following up patients for mortality in Wales that meant we had to change 
our analytical approach from a binary mortality outcome to a time to event outcome with hazard ratios because we didn't have post discharge mortality for patients in Wales so we had to change the design. We know that only affected a very tiny number of patients though. And finally of course overall you'll notice those who are studying the numbers very carefully that there are far fewer patients in the trial that we expect is around 17,000 patients in a trial rather than the 25 that we would have expected. In terms of baseline data, the two groups appear pretty well matched in terms of gender, in terms of diagnostic indication for emergency abdominal surgery and so on. Estimated risk of death was one of the process measures, one of the things that we attempted to change. So it's perhaps not a surprise that there was an increase in the documented risk of death for patients in the quality improvement arm. And that, to some extent, does affect the pattern of risk between the two groups. You can also see a fairly even spread between the two groups in terms of things like ASA score, in terms of preoperative blood pressure, coma score and lactate. I tried to persuade my statistician colleagues that you couldn't have a coma score of 14.8, but they got very cross with me. So I decided to back off and not have that conversation. Process measures are interesting now. As Carol's explained, there were 37 elements to this care pathway, which represented what at the time of setting the trial up was what we all wanted for our grannies. And none of the aspects of the care pathway were revolutionary. None of them were particularly exciting. They're all available in all of the hospitals that took part. We are simply trying to promote their more widespread use. But to understand whether the quality improvement intervention did actually impact on change, we measured 10 process measures specifically, and we decided that we would not put statistical tests on the process measures. There's a lot of discussion with the reviewers of a certain journal that you may have heard of about why we did that. This was a care pathway. It was a single entity that we were trying to promote the use of. And what we didn't want to do at the time of designing the trial was tell people that some things changed significantly and some things didn't. And therefore to unpack the care pathway and reject vast parts of it whilst simply going ahead with other smaller, easier parts of it and thinking that that would be enough. So you can all make your own judgment about whether there is a certain degree of change in any of these process measures or not, but what we're not doing is validating that through the use of statistical testing. Interesting observations, you'll see the consultant decision to operate was very high, Uh, consultant review was very high, consultant presence in the operating theatre was very high. These were things that when I was recruiting sites, I was told we just can't make these things happen. So it's very interesting that they were happening and the perceptions of what was going on amongst senior people within the hospitals and what was actually going on when you count can be very different. So lots of interesting observations you can have there. But bear in mind that this table suggests that Epoch was one enormous hospital with one enormous set of process measures. And actually what went on in terms of individual process measures in individual hospitals is much, much more complicated, much more sophisticated than this table will suggest. I put this here to create a little bit of suspense. (laughs) And so I didn't forget that you guys don't know what the findings are. Do you like to know what the findings are? You're not sure. Okay, you're a bit nervous. I'm a bit nervous too. In fact, we didn't show any difference in mortality at all. There was no impact on 90-day mortality and no suggestion of an an non-significant trend of mortality related to the quality improvement project and the care pathway we sought to implement. Nor was there any impact at all on 180-day mortality from this quality improvement approach. You can imagine our frustration after all the work we'd done, let alone your frustration after all the work you'd done. Interestingly, hospitals stay. There's a very complicated statistical anomaly that that indicates that, that it was slightly shorter in the usual care group. But overall, you can tell from this graph that there was no meaningful difference in hospital stay between the groups either. But if you look at the process measures, and this is a a, a quite sophisticated breakdown of all the process measures that we collected in the trial, you can see there's enormous variability in what people tried to change and what what they attempted to change. The purple bar, parts of the bar suggest that things were okay, uh, that they attempted to change. The blue, things were okay already, and the grey, that they weren't going to try and change those factors. And what you can see is a very, very wide variation, again treating the trial as one big hospital, in what things we tried to change 
in, uh, within the trial. And when you drill that down as we're going to and look at individual hospitals and those that we believe were more successful in delivering the quality improvement uh, intervention and those who were more successful in achieving change in those hospitals compared to those that weren't, And we hope that that will be able to give us some indication of whether there was a a good case that there were improvement in individual hospitals. And this is where I go back to that quality improvement. That's that step wedge uh, design and trying to implement a quality improvement project within it. We uh, based a lot of what we did in uh, Epoch on the Elkquick study in four hospitals in the south of England, led by Neil Quiney, but also which Carol Peden was very involved with. Those were four early adopter hospitals. They were co-located. There was a lot of commonality of purpose within those hospitals. But at the time we did Epoch, the genuine belief was that we just needed to roll up our sleeves and get on and do this, and that we all knew what needed to be done, and that if we could communicate the risks of emergency laparotomy to all our colleagues, we would be able to affect change. The learning, and this is beautifully described in the ethnographic study, and if you don't know what ethnography is, you can emphasise it out as it's why a doctor's so awkward. Uh, uh, it, it's a form of social science, it's qualitative research, I'm a doctor, I can say that. Uh, uh, it's a form of social science that, that does interviews and focus groups and that kind of tool to help us understand what happened. Now you should really read Graham Martin's paper. Uh, uh, it, it, it may not seem the type of science that you're interested in reading, but anybody who was involved in Epoch will be fascinated by the narrative quotes and so on and interpretation of those quotes by an objective scientist not by people like me with prejudicial views about the experiences hospitals had everybody had challenges but some of those challenges were much greater in some hospitals than others a lot of hospitals found entering data on NELA itself to be the biggest challenge and struggled to move on from that to actually affecting change in their organisation And I think that is a really, really important thing. If we burden these hospitals down with data collection, they simply won't have time to deliver what we need to in terms of change. We felt that the intervention was very, very good in delivering the capability to change. So Carol and Tim were fantastic at motivating and training people in how to deliver quality improvement. But then they went back to their hospitals with no protected time, without the support that we sought from trust boards. They just didn't have the time in a lot of hospitals to make change happen. And these are the kind of sophisticated, nuanced findings that are really, really important because I don't believe that Epoch shows quality improvement doesn't work. What it shows is that this quality improvement project didn't work and it tells us exactly why and if we want our next quality improvement project to work we've got to learn these lessons or we will still uh, carry on tilting at windmills without any any great effect and you can uh, understand from the findings that we've got so far that there was no cost effectiveness uh, uh, benefit from the quality improvement project Uh, there's a very very detailed uh, health economic analysis which I'm not going to share with you today. So my interpretation, my subjective view of what we found, well, it's clear that there was no survival benefit from this programme in this trial and that there was no benefit from our secondary outcomes in terms of hospital stay and hospital readmission. But we do believe we're incredibly effective in delivering a quality improvement capability to our leads in our individual hospitals. They were very engaged, and if you, any of you went to any of the quality improvement regional events, you will have met incredibly enthusiastic, switched-on, capable people who knew what they needed to do. The learning was that some of those uh, uh, investigators achieved and others didn't, and there are some really interesting differences in why. Perhaps one of the biggest, in a social science sense, observations is that the quality improvement leads who are more networked within their hospital. They already had quite good relationships across professional boundaries within their hospital, had a network in place when they started the quality improvement. Whereas those QI leads that didn't necessarily have such an extensive network struggled because they had to build that network before they could commence a quality improvement. And if we think of ourselves as anaesthetists, we're often backroom boys. We, like to, we don't like the limelight. We want to be in the back knowing that we're doing our job really, really well and supporting other people to succeed. And so perhaps some of us anaesthetists aren't the most naturally networked quality improvement leads, and that may be something worth thinking about. The capacity to drive change is obviously really, really important. 
Then NHS trusts really need to back these kinds of quality improvement initiatives with resources if they're going to affect change. Uh, we found that hospitals tackle change in very different ways. They tackle different parts of the care pathway and so on. Uh, uh, and that if they're to achieve that, they need the resources to do so. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Top and remember, you can join the Top Med Talk team live at one of our many broadcasts. ebpom.org for details. Go to the website now, ebpom.org.